Now that we've introduced the first law of thermodynamics, we want to talk about some specific processes that present special cases in thinking about what's going on with the first law. The first of these is an adiabatic process. So by definition, for an adiabatic process, no energy is transferred into or out of the system as heat. Q equals zero. So the first question is, well, how can a process be adiabatic? There are two ways I can make a process adiabatic. The first is I can isolate the system, meaning there's no pathway available for the energy to be transferred into or out of the system as heat. The second is the process can happen quickly. When it happens quickly, that means there's not enough time for energy to be transferred into or out of the system as heat. I can make a process adiabatic by eliminating the two things that are necessary for energy to be transferred as heat, pathway for that energy to flow, and time for it to happen. Now in terms of the first law, if Q equals zero, then this Q term disappears and that tells me that the change in the internal energy of my system is simply equal to negative the work done by the system. If I have an adiabatic expansion, the expansion means that my volume is increasing which means that the work done by my system is positive during an expansion. And so this negative sign tells me that that means that the internal energy of my system will decrease during an adiabatic expansion. On the other hand, if I have an adiabatic compression, the compression tells me that the work done by the system was negative. The negative work term multiplied by the negative sign out front says that the internal energy increases during an adiabatic compression. The second process that we'll talk about is an isochoric process. An isochoric simply means that you hold the volume constant. So the volume doesn't change during an isochoric process. Another label we could use for an isochoric process is isovolumetric. So why does it matter if a process is isochoric? Well, if your volume doesn't change, then no work can be done on the system or by the system. For work to occur on your system, the volume of your system has to change. So for an isochoric process, this work term disappears, which means that the change in the internal energy of your system is simply equal to the energy transferred into or out of your system as heat. So if you transfer energy into your system as heat, all that energy is going to go to increasing the internal energy of your system, and you have what's known as isochoric heating. On the other hand, if you transfer energy out of your system as heat, then the total energy of your system decreases and you have what's known as isochoric cooling. The third special process we want to talk about is actually a series of processes. And so this is a cyclic process. And so what this means is you start at some initial state. Your system proceeds through a number of processes, however many it needs to, but it ends up returning to its initial state. So it goes around a cycle. Why does it matter if a process is cyclic? Well, in going around a cycle, that means it ends up at the same state where it started. So the initial state of your system is the same as the final state of your system. And energy is a state variable. It only cares about what state the system is in not the processes you went through in going from one state to another. So if you end up back at the same state you started at, then the energy of your system has to be the same, which means that over your complete cycle, delta E is zero. Well, if the energy doesn't change over the cycle, that means that Q has to equal work by. So if Q equals work by, that means that the net work done by the system during the cycle must equal the net energy transferred to the system as heat over the cycle. And so there are two situations where this is important. The first is if the net energy transfer as heat over the cycle was positive, so Q is positive, that means the work done by the system was positive and you have what's known as an engine. So an engine works because you deposit more energy into the system as heat than what is dumped out and that gets converted into your engine doing work. So work is done by your system in that case. On the other hand, if over the cycle you dump out more energy as heat 
than what you take in. So Q is negative, which means that the work done by your system is also negative. Then in that case, you have a refrigerator. And what typically makes a little bit more sense in terms of talking about a refrigerator is that, well, if the work done by the system is negative, then the work done on the system is positive. And so you do positive work on your system that results in a net transfer of energy as heat out of the system. And that's what a refrigerator does. You've done positive work on the system and it is transferred energy as heat out of the system. So the last special case we want to look at is what's known as an adiabatic free expansion. So let's say that I have two insulated chambers. They're connected by a tube. Initially that tube is blocked by a stopper. All of my gas is sitting over here in one chamber. It's just a vacuum over here in the other. So what happens once the stopper is removed? Well obviously if I take the stopper out, the gas is going to expand so that now it's in both chambers. Because those chambers were insulated, this has to be an adiabatic process. These insulated chambers means that there was no pathway for energy to flow into or out of the system during this process as heat. Because the gas expanded into a volume, it didn't need to do any work in moving into the second chamber. So the work done by the system is also zero. So for an adiabatic free expansion, both of your two terms on the right hand side of the first law of thermodynamics are zero. Q is zero, the work done by your system is zero. So here's a situation where the energy change of your system is zero. It's simply zero because no energy was exchanged either as heat or through work as part of this process. Now an important thing to point out is that unlike the previous processes that we've been talking about where we could plot them on a PV diagram and saying I started at some initial point, I went to some final point and I can draw the line that tells you what were the states that I went through in getting from my initial state to my final state. I cannot plot an adiabatic free expansion on the PV diagram. It's not reversible. So in, in having that line that connects my initial state to my final state what we're saying is that we know how we got there and can go back by basically undoing all these infinitesimal little what are known as quasi-static steps along our PV diagram. We can't connect the dots in terms of the initial state and the final state on a PV diagram for an adiabatic free expansion. This process is not reversible and we'll see why that matters when we talk about the second law of thermodynamics in the next module. So just to sum up, here are the four special processes that we talked about. An adiabatic process, an isochoric or isovolumetric process, a cyclic process, and an adiabatic free expansion. Here's what each one of those means. And again, fundamentally, in terms of what's going on with the first law, Q equals zero in an adiabatic process, so that term disappears work equals zero in an isochoric process, so that term disappears from the first law. Delta E equals zero around a full cycle, so that term disappears from the first law. And in my adiabatic free expansion, delta E simply equals zero because the individual energy transfer terms both equal zero.